shine on the light We all over the world, chat night Africa We all over the world, chat night Africa Welcome to chat night, we bring you good vibes, we shine on the light Welcome to chat night, we bring you good vibes, we shine on the light We all over the world, chat night Africa Give you good vibes Chennai Africa Welcome to Chennai All over the world We are shining the light Chennai Africa Welcome to Chennai Hello everyone Welcome to this week's edition Of Healthline on Chat Night Africa My name is Divine Chiamukong And I'm anchoring this broadcast From Washington DC Metropolitan area this show is airing concurrently on www.chatnightafrica.net. That's on the internet. It's also on YouTube, LinkedIn, and on our Facebook page, followed across Africa by thousands and thousands of people. Once again, thank you for deciding to watch this week's edition of Healthline. Chances are that you might go to bed this night and not get up tomorrow morning. People die in their sleep, drop off their feet, and others die while driving. The heart in your body oftentimes sends no advance notification before it stops. And when it does stop, especially in Africa and other parts of the world, such deaths are attributed to witchcraft. But is it really? We invited Harvard-trained cardiothoracic surgeon, the renowned world-class top-notch Professor Nche Abegli Zama to throw light on why you too, I mean you watching this broadcast, could drop dead in just seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming our guest on Healthline, Professor Nche Abegli Zama. <laughs> Professor Zama, thank you for coming to take some sorted questions on Healthline on Chat Night Africa. How have you been? You've been missing. For a long time. Oh, good, my brother. First up, uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity uh, to fellowship with the folks out there. I know it's been a while. Uh, in the past year, or I'd say past year and a half, I was uh, embroiled in the political arena. I ran uh, for governor of Pennsylvania, and that kept me quite busy for an entire year. And uh, so I'm back uh, in my usual realm now in healthcare. I love that briefly. For my I, I, I know that's your passion, sir. Yes, yes. Cutting, cu cutting, slicing into people's hearts. Uh, <laughs> how many, before, we, be, before we get to the nitty gritty of the program, sir, how many heart surgeries would you say you've done since you, you, you graduated from Harvard? Oh, I, thousands. I, I, I can't even count. <laughs> I want to thank you, sir. Thousands uh, across the world, yeah. Mm. Now, let's get into it. Cardiac arrest, heart failure, heart attacks. What differentiates them, sir? So first up, uh, the heart is uh, a pump. Fundamentally, that's what it is. It's a pump that's located in the chest, and it pumps blood that nourishes our bodies. And that blood is oxygen rich. The heart beats about 120,000 times a day and rarely takes a break. And uh, our bodies need it, our brains need it, and uh, every organ in your body needs the heart because it needs that blood that contains oxygen and nutrients that will keep it going. And so sometimes the heart uh, 
stops doing what it's supposed to do. It stops pumping. And when that happens, the entire body hurts. We don't want that to happen. And sometimes it may happen briefly. So you get uh, a transient cardiac arrest, or it goes it's into an abnormal rhythm and stops pumping effectively. And then within seconds or so, it resumes its normal function. And so when you say heart attack, you're talking about an event that occurs and the heart sustains injury from that event. For example, a significant blockage in a coronary artery, which are the tiny pipes that supply blood to the heart. When that happens, the specific coronary artery that supplies blood to a specific region of the heart becomes compromised or the lumen of the vessel becomes compromised. And then that region of the heart begins to uh, feel the pinch. It's starved from uh, oxygen rich blood. And then it starts to die. And that's what constitutes a heart attack. But when we talk about a cardiac arrest, it's sort of a general term. You can get a cardiac arrest that follows or is associated with a heart attack. You can get a cardiac arrest when the heart, for whatever reason, goes into an, an abnormal rhythm. You see, uh, most of us, uh, most of you out there who are listening to me, your heart beats in a normal a rhythm we call a normal sinus rhythm, very predictable. Loop, doop, loop, doop, loop, doop, loop, doop. And sometimes the heart can go into an abnormal rhythm that is not as rhythmic and may actually cause, lead to a significant decrease in the amount of blood that's pumped out of the heart. And so your entire body, and most especially your brain, becomes stunned. So you can get a cardiac arrest because of that abnormal rhythm. And sometimes the heart can go into a standstill and just stops beating. And uh, that's not very good because if it stays that way, then you die. If it's transient, you may suffer reversible or sometimes irreversible damage to your brain and maybe other organs in your body. You are watching Professor Nche Abedi Zama. Today we are talking about cardiovascular problems, problems that could lead to the stoppage of your heart. And we've seen so many people just die, drop off their feet like that, and that's it. Uh, in Africa, as I said in my introduction, people quickly say, oh, it, it's, it, it's witchcraft. After all, if they cannot explain the circumstance, something supernatural would have to have taken place. That's how they see it. Again, that's the reason we brought you here on Healthline. We really appreciate you, sir. Now, what's the scope of this problem? How common is, uh, uh, do, we, do you have this happening? So... Um, I will discuss this under the umbrella of cardiovascular disease, which is the most common cause of death in America and really the entire world, in Africa as well. And, uh, and what happens is, if you imagine the heart is like the engine that runs your car, and if the engine stops running, you're not going anywhere. And so... Uh, cardiac disease in general is extremely common. And uh, now there's a whole garden variety of problems that constitute cardiovascular disease. Uh, one of those is a heart attack. Uh, uh, we call it a myocardial infarction. That's just a fancy way to say a heart attack. That's when you get a blockage in a coronary artery, for example, an artery that supplies blood, because the heart itself needs blood to keep it going. Oxygen-rich blood that also has nutrients. Now, if you shut off that blood supply to a part of the heart, uh, it can actually stop working and you can get a heart attack. 
So that's one of the causes. Uh, another thing that can happen is that the heart can go into an arrhythmia, a bad rhythm, and, uh, and then it would stop functioning or would not function as well. Uh, another cause could be trauma. Say you're driving um, maybe recklessly or you weren't wearing your seatbelt and uh, you, you know, get involved in a head-on collision and you slam your chest against the steering wheel. That traumatic event in itself can cause damage to your heart. And uh, it may actually rupture your heart because the, the muscle of the heart, especially the front part of your heart, which is really the right side of the heart, it's in the front, uh, it can actually rupture and you can die instantly. And so that's a cardiovascular problem that we do see in practice. But what are the causes? You say, well, by and large, if you look at heart disease, what are the risk factors? I would say things like diabetes, that is not well treated uh, or not well managed, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, you know, cigarette smoking, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, if you're not as physically active. And most importantly, if you do have a family history of cardiovascular disease or a heart attack at an early age, if you have a mother or father, a brother or a sister who uh, either succumbed to or suffered from severe cardiovascular disease at a very young age, then you may have a family gene uh, that would put you at risk of developing cardiovascular disease down the line. I'm going to uh, ask you a question about uh, diabetes as a risk factor, and that's because my mother is exactly one year as I lost my mother. She, uh, fortunately, she did not uh, um, develop the complications that we know of diabetes. She didn't have a heart attack. She died at 93. So that's dear to me when you talk about diabetes. Now, but the question is, how does diabetes lead to or become a problem or lead to you having a heart attack or any other heart problems? So. Diabetes is really a terrible disease that affects almost every organ in the body. It affects your brain. Uh, it affects uh, your heart. It, it affects the lungs, the kidneys. So people who have diabetes, there's some diabetics who go on to have renal failure, kidney failure, and maybe uh, need dialysis or, or kidney transplant. It affects your liver. So it affects uh, every major organ in your body. But speaking specifically about the heart, what diabetes does to the heart is that it increases your chances of developing those blockages that I was talking about in your coronary arteries. You can imagine an organ like the heart that must continue to beat, to contract, to keep the body alive from the day you're born till the day you die. It works around the clock. This heart, that is so hardworking, needs a reliable source of nutrients and oxygen. We all need every single cell of the trillions of cells in your body needs oxygen. And the pump that makes sure that all those cells get the oxygen and the nutrients they need is the heart. And it never stops working. So the heart itself, as I stated earlier, needs reliable blood supply. And that blood supply is provided to the heart via these tiny vessels called coronaries. And diabetics, they have a greater chance of developing blockages within those coronaries. And these coronaries are tiny vessels. I'm talking about uh, two millimeters or less in diameter. So they're very tiny. So it wouldn't take a lot to clog them. And when you do that, the supply of blood to the heart muscle no longer meets the demands of the heart, the law of economics of the heart. So when supply is not equivalent to demand, supply is down, the demand stays the same, uh, then you start to run into problems. And so in diabetics, uh, there's a greater likelihood diabetics uh, that do not control the blood sugar, diabetes that's not adequately treated, uh, puts you at risk, a significant risk, for developing coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease in general. 
you are watching Huffline on Chat Night Africa. Doug, if I come to see you in uh, your office or at the hospital, you often would tell me it's important for me to go and exercise, work out, um, and, and, and that I can understand as a specialist in heart matters. You're going to tell me that. Um, but how can you explain, sir, that you have people who exercise like, like monsters? We've seen in the United States football players drop off their feet um, a case in Cameroon that kind of shook everybody um, was that of Song Bahana, the current coach of the Lions. Fortunately, he lived through it, and today he's the coach. We also saw, and I watched the match, which um, um, uh, th this guy, uh, the name is going off my mind, but, but I, I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, he fell off and uh, just disappeared like that. So... Um, we would like to know what must have happened then. You are watching Voices of Africa and uh, Halfline on Chat Night Africa. My name is uh, Divine Chamukong. Uh, Dr. Zama fell off the line and he will be reconnecting momentarily. So don't worry, stay tuned. We have a lot of questions for him. And we will also be um, opening the phone line for you to dial 240-603-7367. Uh, we will be opening the phone line 240-603-7367 so that you can actually um, ask him your question and the entire planet will be listening to you. Dr. Zama is back on in the lobby and I'm going to bring him in st into stream. Dr. Zama, I was asking you, I was asking you, sir, how do you explain that you have this robust, I mean, big guys who play American football, what, and then you have um, Mark Vivian Foy, that's the name that escaped my memory. Mm -hmm. I was watching a game several years ago here in Silver Spring, Maryland, and he dropped off and I saw his eyes rolled and that was it. Yeah. How do you explain that when I come to your office and you're asking me to go and do what those guys are doing and yet still get into cardiac situations? Yes, it's very unfortunate. We see these events uh, all too often. And just because you're healthy and you're robust and you have a normal physical exam in a doctor's office doesn't preclude you from the possibility of suffering or succumbing to a catastrophic cardiac event. Now, and just like a car engine, and if you really overwork that engine and if you're driving at a very high speed uh, for a prolonged period of time, uh, you know, you, you may suffer an engine breakdown. So the car, the heart itself, is, is, is like an engine. So excessive exertion, extreme exertion can actually lead to cardiac complications and unfortunately in some people to sudden death. And, uh, a permanent cardiac arrest. Also, uh, there are individuals who have um, maybe some electrical abnormalities involving their heart. And see, the heart has an electrical system with electrical cables as well. And sometimes, like with any complex network uh, that we know in our lives, whether it's our computers, uh, we just had a little uh, event a few minutes ago where I was I suddenly went offline even though I wasn't touching the computer. Those things can happen as well to the heart. And if that happens and the heart begins to beat in a rhythm that is not a normal rhythm, a normal sinus rhythm, it can lead to a sudden cardiac arrest. And, and also, as I've talked about, you can have significant blockage in your coronary arteries, but still be robust and physically active and not have any symptoms at all. And that's scary because if that blockage is at a critical point and you happen to be, let's take a football player, for example, on a football pitch and running around, there's a lot of physical exertion. The heart is pumping vigorously. And so the demands on the heart go up, but the supply of blood cannot meet those demands because of a blockage that you're not aware of. It can get to a critical point where 
the heart sort of just gives up and you suffer a heart attack. Now, I've been talking just about the heart, but the heart cannot be looked at in isolation. There's a, a bunch of highways that emanate from the heart, that start at the heart and spread out hundreds of miles away from the heart. We call them blood vessels. And one of the major blood vessels, the aorta, that's attached to the heart. Time and again, we see individuals who suffer a sudden cardiac arrest. And then when we do the autopsy or when they evaluate them, they see that they may have ruptured their aorta. Maybe they had uh, an aneurysm in the aorta. What's an aneurysm? It's like a bubble that forms in the aorta, like a little balloon in a part of an aorta. And then it thins out the aorta. The aorta is usually very muscular, very elastic. But if you get an aneurysm in the aorta and you're unaware of it, and that wouldn't show in a physical examination, and you're out there exerting yourself and your blood pressure goes up, and your blood pressure goes up as a natural response to that physical activity, the exertion that you're involved in, and you can uh, unfortunately rupture your aorta, your aorta can rupture. And when that happens, the vast majority of people die suddenly. Or you can develop a tear in the aorta. It's called an aortic dissection. And then, unfortunately, if it ruptures, and which it does in the vast majority of patients, unless you're close enough to a hospital where you can get emergent surgery and hopefully survive, uh, you may succumb uh, to this problem, to this complication. Doctor, um, I, I, there's a comment there uh, from Aneneba Akufo. I think you just explained that, but I think she, he's just posting that now. Please have Dr. Uh, Nche Abedizama explain to us why Dama Hamlin, the M NFL abuse player, suffered about two weeks ago. Uh, what, what may have been, I know you don't have uh, the, uh, his report, but what may have happened? So. What it is, is that uh, he suffered a traumatic event where he was inadvertently punched in the chest in the location right over overlying the heart, part of his, that part of his chest cage, his chest wall. And what happened then was that the impact of that uh, on the heart caused, caused uh, caused what we call stunning of the heart muscle. The heart muscle was stunned because of that traumatic impact. Uh, and, uh, and what happened then that it, it went out of its normal rhythm. So the heart was, his heart was beating in a normal rhythm. And when that happened, it degenerated from a normal rhythm to an extremely abnormal rhythm and he passed out. And as we noticed, he, he received CPR, and I'm not sure he received the defibrillation there, but he left the football pitch with a pulse intact. So what happened to him was a traumatic uh, impact on the heart muscle. And, uh, and you, it, that can happen. And it, we've seen it time and again, where somebody it's punched, even a boxer, even a couple of people just hustling around and they get punched over the chest, uh, over the, uh, the heart and the part of the chest, the left chest in particular, and then somebody passes out. That's because the heart is stunned, stunned. The electrical system goes crazy and effective contraction of the heart seizes and you go into a cardiac arrest. Uh, Professor Nche Abedli Zama, as you could know, you, you must have realized this guy is a powerhouse in matters of the heart. <laughs> and my name is Sir Divine Chamukong. I am the host for Chat Night, um, a half line on Chat Night Africa. Dog, do, when, when we hear people affected by this or that kind of physical um, health condition, Oftentimes, you scientists, because you're also a scientist, say, oh, well, people of color, Africans, are sometimes black people are disproportionately uh, affected. It, it would, would it be the same thing in matters of uh, heart health? 
Yes, uh, it is. And let me explain why. Uh, first of all, when we talk about cardiovascular disease within a population, uh, you have to often talk about the risk factors involved. And I've stated uh, high blood pressure, which we call hypertension, uh, high cholesterol and cigarette smoking, uh, obesity, you know, uh, stress. And if you look at all these risk factors, um, you find that oftentimes uh, uh, people of color in general are uh, more challenged because of the economic situations that they live in. And so uh, these risk factors have a lot to do with also their social situations. And so if you see uh, among the black population, for example, the incidence of hypertension, high blood pressure is extremely high. And if hypertension is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, it doesn't take a lot for us to understand why the incidence of cardiovascular disease is so high among the black population and people of color in general. And I'll take this a little further, people in lower economic uh, or challenged economic situations uh, would have uh, more of these risk factors and therefore their risk of contracting cardiovascular disease or developing cardiovascular disease is a lot higher. Additionally, yes, many, go ahead, sir. Of many black folks uh, uh, do not have the access to the type of healthcare that leads to an early diagnosis and intervention as, uh, uh, as others do and people of color in general. Therefore, the incidence of cardiovascular, severe cardiovascular disease is uh, higher among the black population and people of color and those who are economically challenged. So it's multifactorial. There are many factors and most of those are social. Now, there are also genetic predispositions. There, there seem to be a higher incidence of certain cardiovascular diseases among people of color and Africans in general. I have a question from Rose Meringet Sap Loom. Uh, what, are, doctor, what are the best preventive measures out there? I was gonna to come to that. Um, is aspirin recommended? If yes, how often should healthy individuals take baby aspirin? This question I was gonna ask you about prevention because uh, doctor, imagine going to bed now and not knowing whether um, you will get up in the morning can be very, very scary. I don't know. I mean, you are a heart specialist, a heart surgeon. When you know these things, and I'm going to ask you this question before we get to Rosemary's question. When you know about how fragile the heart is, do you go to sleep when you go to bed? Sure. Um, I do. What, what gives right you that thing. peace of mind? Well, we're all a product of our genes and our environment. And I've talked about the genetic predisposition to cardiovascular disease. If you pick the wrong parents, uh, sometimes you're screwed. Because, uh, you know, if you got that gene for severe cardiovascular disease from your father or your mother, then there's a greater likelihood that you will suffer from cardiovascular disease. And so uh, realizing that I'm a product of my genes and my environment, I may not be able to manipulate my genes, uh, my genetic makeup, to reduce my chances of getting cardiovascular disease. But the thing that I know I can do is control the environmental factors. So I keep my weight down. And how do I do that? I exercise almost daily. And, uh, and when I talk about exercise, I don't mean you have to do a five minute mile on a daily basis. No, just 30 minutes of brisk walking each day can significantly, about 15%, reduce your chances of dying from cardiovascular disease. Think about that. And then uh, nutrition. I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of us understand that the obesity crisis in America has increased the incidence of cardiovascular disease, and especially among minorities. Why is that? When you're overweight, chances are you will develop high blood pressure. When you're overweight, you will develop type two diabetes. When you're overweight, chances are your cholesterol level is much higher. And when you're overweight, chances are you have 
a more of a sedentary lifestyle. And if you're overweight, chances are you're under more stress. So just by being obese, you've been able to embrace all the major risk factors of cardiovascular disease. And if you look around you in the population, at least in America and many other places in the world, in America where over 80% of adults are overweight, you begin to see that, yes, if you control your weight, we know what we can do. You set up an actionable strategy of reducing your weight to your normal uh, healthy weight, you will be reducing your chances of cardiovascular disease. And if you smoke and you stop smoking, you can significantly reduce your chances of cardiovascular disease. And I will take this even further. If you address high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, and the obesity crisis, you can cut the incidence of cardiovascular disease by about 50% worldwide. I know um, a friend, a lady who is kind of uh, not obese, smallish in build. She has high blood pressure. Now I understand she was smoking for a long time and she also drinks quite a bit. So uh, the question would be, somebody's going to say, hey, look, I, I know people who've been smoking for decades they died of something else, not heart attack. How do you explain that, sir? Yeah. Well, the most common cause of death for humans is usually a heart attack, cardiac. But uh, unless we do autopsies and everybody would we be, be able to realize that. But the studies have shown that. Yes, there are individuals who do all the bad things, who smoke and don't eat the right stuff, and maybe they'll live up to the rightful age of 80 or 90 and above. But uh, remember what I said about we're a product of our genes and our environment. Uh, science is still grappling with this, with those factors, those protective factors that enable an individual uh, who does all these bad things to still be able to enjoy a long life expectancy. I knew a Hollywood actor from years ago who would oftentimes do commercials with a cigarette dangling from his lips. He lived up to the rightful age of somewhere around the mid nineties. And so there are genetic exceptions, but you can't live your life making your decisions based on the exceptions. We know that science shows us that if you do that, you have a greater likelihood of succumbing. And in this case, we're talking about cardiovascular disease, the cardiovascular disease. Uh, so there's some people you can have a family where Everybody catches a cold and that one person in the family doesn't. Time and again, they, they, you know, they have a much more robust immune system, but they share many of the genes in the family like every, anybody else, everyone else. And so I'll take this a little further. I believe that the future of medicine and disease as we know it, the answers to many of these questions will come from molecular biology, our genetics, you are watching Healthline, and my guest this week is Harvard-trained cardiothoracic uh, surgeon, Professor Nche Ablegli Zama. <laughs> Professor, there is a question that just was sent me. Um, uh, the question is, what is, how does salt the salt that we have in our breads and lots of the things, the salt, all kinds of stuff, and sugar, do they in any way contribute to the deterioration of our hearts? If yes, how? That's a text message. And the phone line is open after doctor answers this question. You can dial the number 240-603-7367, 240 -603 603-7367 and ask your question directly to Professor Nche Abegli Zama. Yes, sir, how do you respond to the text? So, uh, salt, a table salt, which we refer to as sodium chloride. We all learned that in basic chemistry in secondary school, sodium chloride. And the mechanism by which it affects our bodies adversely uh, is complicated and it involves many actors. And some of those actors include your vascular system, the vast uh, maze of arteries in your body, the 
renal system, that's the kidneys, and, uh, and the mechanism that controls a human's blood pressure. And we know, science has showed us that uh, if you, your salt intake can determine or it's related to your blood pressure. So oftentimes people who uh, eat an excessive amount of salt a day, now the recommended amount of salt a day is only about a teaspoonful, but a lot of people eat several teaspoonfuls, uh, consume several teaspoonfuls of, uh, of salt a day. And so what happens is that the more salt you eat, the greater likelihood you'll have of developing high blood pressure. And, uh, and so when you do that consistently, you develop hardening of the arteries in your body. It's something called atherosclerosis. That's a fancy name for hardening of the arteries. And so salt consumption can accelerate atherosclerosis. And if, then if you have hardening of the arteries, they begin to lose their natural flexibility. They don't function as well as they normally would. And also, you start to destroy the architecture of your arteries, and that may lead to formation of calcium. Your arteries begin to turn into rocks. And actually, on x-ray, you can see them lighting up And in life. When we uh, uh, open people up, you can actually, and sometimes I need practically an ax to cut into an artery because it's all calcified. So salt can lead to vascular disease and uh, your blood vessels become hardened and ultimately develop blockages and narrowing in your arteries. And, and so if that high blood pressure causes disease in the blood vessels, the heart begins to work harder because the arteries into which the heart pumps are not as flexible. So you can see what happens to the heart. If the heart is pumping blood, through significant impedance, resistance, after a while, it'll get tired. Not only that, because of high blood pressure and the problems it's caused to the arteries that supply blood to the heart itself, those arteries begin to narrow and narrow. They get narrower and narrower and diminish the amount of blood that's flowing to the heart. So the heart is suffering not just from the mechanical impedance, the resistance to doing its job because your arteries are now very hard. It's also suffering because now its own arteries, the coronaries, are being compromised. And that's a formula for disaster. And I'll take that a little further. So if you eat excessive amounts of salt, and I'm talking about the heart and these arteries, but there's something else called stroke. And everybody out there has heard of somebody who suffered a stroke. You look at the arteries that convey blood to your brain, for example, your carotid arteries. The hardening that I'm talking about can also occur in those arteries and narrow them. And, and if they narrow down to a crit critical point, blood supply to your brain can be compromised and you can suffer an acute stroke. Also, the arteries that go to your kidney can become so narrow that not enough blood flows to your kidney and you can develop kidney problems. And when you develop kidney problems, and even if your heart was fine and the kidney problems came first, the heart now starts to strain. Because guess what? The kidney filters blood that comes from the heart. The kidney gets the lion's share of blood that leaves the heart. 25% of the blood from each heartbeat goes to the kidneys. So high uh, potassium, uh, high sodium levels, consumption of salt that leads to high blood pressure can cause diseases and all of these important blood vessels in our body and strain the heart and strain the kidneys and put us in a very bad situation. Professor Nche Abegli Zama on Healthline. I, I'd like you to clarify when you say salt sodium is salt sodium same thing sir if yes in what form do people consume these things in large quantities inadvertently yes uh i'm talking about sodium chloride uh, which is a compound that contains sodium and chloride that's table salt as we know it 
And most people, now you will find sodium chloride in almost everything that you eat. It's, it's a naturally occurring compound. And the problems we have is additional salt. And see, when you begin to add salt to your food, over time you'll find that you're starting to add a little bit more salt because the receptors in your tongue, in your mouth, that tell you that you're eating or you're consuming a high concentration of salt, the threshold for, uh, for uh, detecting that amount of sodium becomes uh, significantly elevated. So you require a lot more salt to get the psychological satisfaction or the taste that you normally would uh, from a meal that you're consuming. And so over time, you'll find yourself adding a little bit more. Uh, you've seen people who they reach for the salt shaker when they get a meal placed in front of them, but even before they taste the meal. That, that's a problem right there. And if you do that on a daily basis, and I've told you intrinsically, there's a, an, a certain amount of sodium chloride, salt, in most of the things that we eat. So that additional salt becomes cumulative and over time, can cause I have somebody on the line. Hello, this is Healthline on Chat Night Africa. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yes, Mr. Divine, thank you so much for that program. And thank you so much, Dr. Nchez Zama, for um, the level of the quality of education you're giving to our people. Now, hold it there. Uh, Dr. Zama, do you hear him in your headphones? Yes, I do, actually. Okay, good. So, yes. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Again, I was saying thank you to Dr. Zama for what he's uh, doing to the community. I have very two simple questions. You were talking about salt because, you know, at my house, we no longer eat the regular white salt. My wife goes to the market and she buys something called uh, sea salt or pink salt and all that stuff. Is that different from the one you're talking about or which one is much more healthier? Then the second thing, doctor, is I drink coffee and I drink lots of it every day. That's the only, you know, extra beverage besides water that I drink. Is that good for the heart or that's bad for the heart? Thank you so much, Doctor. Good. Thank you, sir. So, uh, and thank yes. you for the questions. Uh, I'll address the salt issue. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who are, are hawking sea salt. It, it sounds really exotic and fancy and actually sounds a lot healthier. Um, what I would say is the most important thing you own is your body. Don't compromise. It. If, if I came to you and I says, listen, uh, this gasoline you've been using is not good for you. Uh, it's leaded. And I'll give you something that uh, maybe would cause less problems to your engine. I think you will think about it carefully and you, you want to make a very intelligent decision that's in the best interest of your heart. I'm out of your car. Now, what I'm saying is that there are a lot of actors out there that really don't mean well for you. The salt that you call sea salt, it may have other elements like potassium in it and calcium, but fundamentally, the vast majority of the component in sea salt is still sodium chloride. So uh, I wouldn't celebrate because it looks pink you're still consuming a high amount of sodium chloride. You just need to eat regular uh, affordable table salt, but in recommended amounts. And what's that recommendation in 2023? It's a tablespoonful of salt a day, uh, maximum for 60 kilogram adult. And I tell you something, if you reduce the intake of salt in Africa, to this amount that I'm talking about, the statistician and the scientists have extrapolated that you could save about 2 million lives a year on that continent. So this is a serious problem. And your next question was about caffeine. Um, caffeine, there are a lot of studies that have shown that it's good for you, other studies that show it may not be good for you. There's a studies that has shown that for the heart itself, it may not have uh, any damaging effect. But what I can tell you as somebody who's been in the human chest 
thousands of times and has had to address problems uh, not only involving the human heart muscle itself, but the electrical system, that there's a problem called atrial fibrillation. And that's an abnormal heart rhythm, which a lot of people, millions across the world, live with it. And if you have atrial fibrillation, uh, your functional status becomes reduced. The quality of your life is not the same. One of the things that I've seen associated with atrial fibrillation is consumption of caffeine. And so my response to you would be a moderate consumption of caffeine if you do not have any cardiovascular issues may not hurt you. But if you have a history of cardiovascular disease or you have a family history thereof, you're better off staying away from caffeine. Now, is tea better? No, because caffeine is a chemical that is similar to another chemical that's in tea called theobromine. If you look at the chemical structures, they look almost the same except for a few moieties on, a, on, on the chemical uh, structure that uh, differentiate caffeine from tea. So you can still get the same cardiac, adverse cardiac effects drinking, drinking regular tea as you would from caffeine. Uh, but I, like I say, if you have no cardiovascular problems, moderate consumption may be okay. Professor Nche Abeglizama, I want to say, uh, reassure you, uh, Rosemary, I have not uh, forgotten your question about uh, aspirin. But before I get to that, I'm going to ask you a question, Dr. Zama, uh, related to what virtually every human being loves to consume, that sex. Um, we've heard situations that people die, men collapse, as a result of having sex. Is there any correlation between sex and heart attack or heart failure, whatever you want to call it? Yes. So um, sex involves significant physical activity. It involves your autonomic nervous system. And so there's a lot of physiology, a lot of activity, biochemical activities that are ongoing in your body during a sexual encounter and as well as sexual activity. And if you're an individual who has fundamental or pre-existing cardiovascular disease, engaging in a rigorous activity of any kind, whether it's going out for a run, climbing mountains, or you know, working on the farm itself can trigger an adverse cardiovascular event. Well, sex itself, it's also a rigorous activity, and it really depends on how physically engaged the sexual act itself is. And it can task the heart. It can take the heart to task. And uh, earlier I mentioned something about the law of supply and demand. If you have pre-existing coronary disease, for example, and you're unaware of it, you have no symptoms, and you're going about your life doing things. So you pretty much balance that law of economics of your heart, where the supply of blood to the heart equals to the normal demands that your heart is that is that are placed on your heart. But you increase those demands to your heart with vigorous sexual activity, the supply of blood to the heart doesn't go up. That becomes a formula uh, for potential disasters, you can imagine. So in medicine, yes, we do see oftentimes it's not highly publicized because of the embarrassing factor. We do see individuals coming in with heart attacks and that had been precipitated by uh, intense sexual activity. And so my advice often is, um, if you have any of the risk factors that we mentioned earlier, high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, obesity, high cholesterol, and, and, and this, that, and the other, diabetes, you need to have a complete physical evaluation, physical exam by your doctor uh, if you intend to continue intense uh, uh, sexual activity. And also, uh, like I said, obesity, extremely important. We see more of those now than we used to because of this epidemic of obesity. We love Voices of Africa. Keep watching! And my name is Sir Divine Chamukong. I'm your host for Voices of Africa, your host for Chat Night Africa, and your host, of course, for Healthline Family Matters also. 
A couple of questions came in. Let's now go to um, uh, get some Rosemary's, and then we'll go to Aneneba, Grace uh, Ngu Aneneba. Uh, Rosemary asked about aspirin. Would you advise people to take aspirin, especially baby, baby aspirin? If yes, at what age do you start taking that? So up to about four years ago, the recommendation was that people, adults, should take an aspirin a day and it would protect you uh, or reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. And what's that? heart attacks, and strokes. And, uh, and that, for decades, that's that been, been the recommendation. Until a couple of years ago, when the studies actually showed that the risks of taking aspirin in somebody who is not at risk, who doesn't have a, a risk factors for cardiovascular disease, is greater than the benefits. And that risk, one of the most important risks, is with a, a higher incidence of bleeding. Therefore, the American Heart Association came out with a new recommendation in early, about 2019 or so, uh, that said aspirin is recommended uh, only for those who have a known history of cardiovascular disease. Say, for example, you've had a heart attack. You've had coronary bypass surgery in the past. So you've coronary artery disease. You have cardiac disease. Uh, it's recommended unless there's a contraindication, uh, you should take an aspirin a day. But for somebody without a history of cardiac disease or risk factor, significant risk factor thereof, uh, it is not recommended. So that has changed. And Beatrice uh, Fumunin asked the question, Doc, how, how about decaf? You see, we see all this decaf tea, decaf coffee. <laughs> so what's your reaction to our question? How about so, decaf tea? Uh, oftentimes when I speak to my patients, I relate to them what I do. I practice what I preach. Uh, I don't drink anything but water. It's cheap, simple. I don't even drink juices, orange juice, apple juice. Uh, because uh, uh, I believe that water is not going to cost me any problems. Uh, juices are high in sugar. I'd rather eat the fruit because it has half the sugar and twice the fiber. So I'll just move that logic over to caffeine and tea. Now, if you do enjoy drinking coffee, I particularly have no interest in coffee, no tea. If you do drink it, uh, I recommend that you drink coffee that is decaffeinated. Now, remember, it's not 100% decaffeinated uh, or tea that it does not have, quote unquote, caffeine in it. Uh, but you have to know what brand it is because there are many bad actors out there that sell you tea and say this is dark tea or black tea, some kind of tea, gives you the idea that this is more nutritious, but it has a significant amount of agents like caffeine that can have adverse effects on your heart if you consume too much of it. And then Mrs. Aneneba Grace asked a question about Maggie. Doc, <laughs> I'm guilty as charged. So I, I mean, I've seen all these videos about Maggie, Maggie cubes and so on, cooking cubes. What should we do? I mean, if you if you cook and this thing is not there, you ought know to eat it. So <laughs> it's it's a, it's a, an acquired flavor that many of us from. Uh, uh, Many of us, the diaspora, uh, and I've found this traveling the world in the Caribbean, South America, and Asia, where uh, Maggi sauce is extremely popular, and it's it's a it's a very important uh, part of uh, uh, a nutritional concoction in those uh, uh, geographies. Now, having said that, I would recommend that you look at the sodium content in. Maggi sauce. It's a significant amount of sodium. If you have a history of high blood pressure, I would advise you do not uh, use them to cook at all. And uh, if you do, then you have to be extremely judicious about the quantities that you cook with, because it, one of the things that entices us is not just the flavor in it, it's the salt content. 
And, and a lot of us get, quote unquote, have gotten addicted to it because we grew up with it. Our grandparents used it. Our parents used it. And subsequently, uh, we used it in cooking. Now, does it have other adverse health effects? I don't believe so. It's just the sodium content, and especially in many of us, it would not be a very uh, judicious, it, would, it wouldn't be a very good thing to do. Uh, in addition, because rarely do people add Maggi sauce alone, uh, solo to their meals. They do that in addition to uh, the usual amount of salt that they apply in cooking. So you just have to exercise caution, and especially when you know what your risks are and what your, your health status is. We love Voices of Africa. Keep watching! When you talked about uh, uh, alcohol, I remember the song. In my cup, in my cup, I want to see Mimbo in my cup. When guys are boozing, now in case you're not from Cameroon, Mimbo simply means more alcoholic drink. When there's <laughs> when they're in drinking places, they're singing all this in my cup, in my cup, I want to see Mimbo in my cup. I have a question. No, but before I read the question, Doctor, anybody who wants to participate or be heard across the globe, simply can dial the number 240-603-7367. Let me repeat it. 240-603-7367. You see, when you come to Chat Night Africa, this is the quality of conversation you get because you are at the center of the decisions we make here. We talk about kitchen table issues, pocket book issues, money, money matters, family matters, and so on. But um, the question somebody just sent me, so you can, you can dial the number 240-603-7367. Here is what uh, Gael Gemo uh, says. Doctor, we are all of us at work. She's a healthcare professional. I think she holds a master's in healthcare. Um, uh, doctor, we are watching from London with all our colleagues at work. Thank you so much. And um, so let me go to the question. It's about now, if you're a woman watching this, this one concerns you. Doctor, are women at a higher risk of having heart disease than men? If yes, why? Uh, well, Women have a risk as high as men. The problem is, and this is an extremely important uh, issue, cardiovascular disease is extremely common in women, but there are specific challenges. First of all, cardiovascular disease in general, heart disease does not present the same way it does in men. In my practice, I've seen women who've suffered heart attacks after having visited a thousand different doctors for gastrointestinal problems. Women generally will not present with the classic chest, crushing chest pain radiating to the arm or jaw pain that uh, uh, is uh, uh, so uh, common among men. They present with uh, gastrointestinal problems. They present with heartburn, uh, gastric, the food doesn't taste like it used to. Uh, the food that doesn't agree with me, the food that used to be. Uh, I have a lot of heartburn. And I had a woman who had exhausted uh, the supplies of Maalox and Mylanta in a local pharmacy, only to find out that she had severe coronary disease and I wound up doing a quadruple bypass on her. So, uh, and what happens too is that people don't pay attention to women's complaints when they show up in the emergency room in a doctor's office. And sometimes women would show up with a history of depression. And it's really cardiovascular disease. It can present in really strange ways. And if a woman shows up and she just complains of this feeling of impending doom, I just don't feel right. I don't have any energy. And, and what do a lot of doctors do, unfortunately? They start looking at psychosocial uh, answers to her problem or causes and how are things going with your husband this that and the other so a woman and especially a woman 
who is around perimenopausal, who presents with gastrointestinal issues. I'll give you an example. Reflux, acid reflux. You must always keep in the back of your mind the possibility that you can have cardiovascular disease. And if you're a woman and you go to the doctors and they're trying to sort out these symptoms that you have been complaining about for a while, then ask them. Don't forget to ask them, could this be my heart? And insist to have an evaluation to rule in or rule out the possibility of cardiovascular disease. Therefore, women are not diagnosed as expeditiously or timely manner as men are. So the outcomes for cardiovascular disease in women are generally poorer than men. And I say this implicit bias has not been fair to women. And what's even sad, 60% of the women are dead within a year after their first heart attack. And as a heart surgeon, when I have to operate on a woman, sometimes, uh, you know, it, it, I just, I get worried because their coronary artery disease is so much severe because it's been progressing for so long. And, you know, I'm, I celebrate the fact that they've not died, they've lived long enough to undergo the intervention. But by and large, they have more, much more complications. I think we're at a time now, and many articles have been published about this. A landmark article several years ago in New England Journal of Medicine pointed to this issue. We need to be more attentive to complaints by women because cardiovascular disease is just as common. One in every two and a half women, if you're looking at the statistics in America, will die from cardiovascular disease. This question on the screen, is salt more dangerous in blacks compared to Caucasians? Um, well, salt is dangerous to everybody, uh, excessive amounts of salt, if I may answer as a scientist and logically. Excessive amounts of salt intake is uh, not good for anybody, no matter your race. We must also remember that within each of us, and we're in a realm now where we're talking about precision medicine, individualized medicine, that based on your genetic makeup, how you handle sodium chloride may be different than the way your sibling or your neighbor or your spouse does. So, uh, but what science knows is that salt itself is bad for you, no matter your complexion or your tribe. Uh, we're all the human race. And so- This uh, question from uh, Gael in London. Hello, Gael, say hi to all your colleagues at work watching Healthline on Voices of Africa. Tell them Divine Chamukong in Maryland sends them love. Doctor, what relationship with, what's the relationship within, with long flights and heart attacks? I have heard people die a couple of days after a long flight. Hmm. Yes. Well, ex extremely important question. Uh, one of the unfortunate causes, significant causes of death in America is something called pulmonary embolism. And that's just a fancy uh, term which uh, talk, tells us that there's a clot in a major artery in your lung, the pulmonary artery, that you know fills the artery up and clogs it and prevents blood from flowing from your heart to the lungs. That's not a good situation. And you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse or somebody in healthcare to appreciate uh, the potential lethal impact of that. And so people who will travel long distances, and it may not, it doesn't have to be on long flights. If you're flying from New York to London or Paris or New York to Abuja, or Douala, or wherever you're flying, and sometimes even transcontinental within USA. There was a famous uh, rap musician who just about 10 years ago uh, died acutely after a long flight from New York to Los Angeles. He got to, New to Los Angeles, and uh, within a few hours, he was rushed out off to the hospital, and unfortunately, he succumbed. So if you have been immobile, relatively immobile on a long trip, whether it's a long car ride or uh, a, a flight or on a train or whatever means of transportation you're on, so long as you're not moving around uh, much, there's a risk of blood clot formation forming in your lower extremities 
in the deep veins of your lower extremities. And then at the end of your flight, when you get up and you start moving around, the muscles in your leg will milk that clot up to your heart, which then pumps it uh, with the blood to your lungs and the clot will choke uh, the arteries in your lung. And you can suffer a bad event. You can suffer a heart, a cardiac arrest from that, or you can suffer some respiratory compromise and may need emergent surgery or emergent intervention to dissolve that clot. You know, we have a famous tennis player, one of the Williams sisters who almost died from that. Uh, she suffered a pulmonary embolism. I could go down the list of a lot of people, but there are three things that puts you at risk for pulmonary embolism. Stasis, which means your blood is not moving as fast as it should. If you're sitting still with your knees bent on a plane for eight hours, blood flow in your veins is not going to be as brisk and effective as it used to be. So as the blood flow becomes sluggish, your risk of clot formation goes up. Two, uh, damage to the veins. People who have vein problems, like venous stasis problems, diabetics can develop problems with their veins. That puts them at risk for clot formation. And uh, patients who have, for whatever reason, and there's a whole list of issues that are associated with thick blood, sluggish blood. We call it hypercoagulability. They're easy to clot more so than others. Those are people that are at risk for it. And so what I advise people to do is if you're traveling, embarking on a long journey, get up and move around every hour, at least for 10 minutes. If you're on a plane, get up, move, walk around, develop restless leg syndrome. Or in addition to wear some compression stockings. Don't try to look cool. Wear some compression stockings. I do myself. I'll be traveling in a few hours and I've got my compression stockings ready and I'm flying out a thousand miles up to Wisconsin. You are watching Healthline on Chat Night Africa. Right, that song comes with airlines. <laughs> I thought I should break it in. Um, we have a lot of questions, believe me, coming in. Again, you can dial the number 240-603-7367. This show is currently airing on four different, different social me media platforms. Thanks to my producer, who is thousands of miles away from where I am, anchoring this broadcast, Mr. Z. Roger Full in Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs> Somebody is asking the question, Dr. Zenchet at what age would you recommend, if you would, that somebody go to meet their doctor to do a cardiovascular checkup? Do you make those recommendations, sir? Sure. One, uh, or really, if there are any symptoms that are suggestive of cardiac disease, chest pain, shortness of breath, easy fatigability, you get tired easily. Um, you know, the things that you used to do, you can't do anymore. Uh, well, obviously, as we get older, we don't have the robust feeling and the energy and, and the agility and, and just the energy we used to have. And that's understandable. But if it's sort of a dramatic change or sort of a progressive change, and, and you're just concerned, I think it's important to see a doctor and always insist to get your heart checked. Uh, because a lot of doctors may go by looks. Oh, she looks good, or oh, he looks good. You're nice, thin, thin, fit, and then you go on and die the very next day. But uh, if you're a male or a female with a history of high blood pressure, and I suggest, I tell people, invest in your body. Buy a blood pressure monitoring machine and have one at home. And check your blood pressure at least once or twice a week. And Here I'm is a question. Prof, for the sake of the non-medical audience, can you cite some of the most common factors that predispose to hyper, high, hypercoagulability? For example, okay. birth control pills. <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, I didn't want to get into those details, but I'm glad somebody out there is tuned into it. So hypercoagulability, really, it's a fancy word, and I, I like to break things down, and I want to use these big terms. It really means the body's 
clotting uh, mechanism uh, or somebody makes clots a lot easier than others do. So it's easier for their blood to clot. So if I have your blood and somebody else's blood, the guy who is, a, is in a hypercoagulable situation, their blood will clot faster and easier than yours would. And there are individuals, for example, uh, who are on um, birth control pills can increase your chances of uh, uh, your blood clotting a lot faster and easier. And therefore, it puts you at risk for uh, deep venous clots, deep venous thrombosis, we call it, and having a pulmonary embolism. Also, people with cancer, there's certain cancers. I've had somebody who presented to me a woman with a clot in her lungs and I was asked to open her chest and remove it. And uh, so I took her to surgery, she was dying, cut up, opened her pulmonary artery, extracted a ton of, a handful of clots, and she went on to do very well. But after the operation, I was very concerned because she was not on birth control pills and she looked very healthy. And so I sent her for a CAT scan of her pelvis. And uh, lo and behold, she had a, a tumor in her ovary. So certain types of cancers can present that way. Cancers of the pancreas, cancers of the ovary, cancers of, uh, of, of the thyroid gland, and, and a few other cancers, even kidney cancers can present that way. And so uh, they can, those cancers can make you hypercoagulable, meaning your blood, because of those cancers, and our time doesn't permit me to go into the mechanisms, if you have certain types of cancers, it can increase your chances of getting thicker blood, that your blood can clot a lot easier, and that can lead you into problems potentially, such as pulmonary embolism. I have uh, somebody um, before, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my text at the same time, and um, somebody wants to connect to ask a question. Don't you worry, you've sent me your number. I'm going to uh, uh, call your number right away. And you are watching Healthline on Chat Night uh, Africa. Somebody now going to pick a call. And uh, let's see who that person is. I just had a text message. Everybody wants to talk to you now, <laughs> doctor. Everybody wants to talk to you. I hope the person picks up the call. I think they have. Hello. Hello, this... Divine. Yes, you are listening, watching Healthline on Chat Night Africa. Your question. Hello. Hello. Yes, do you have a question for Professor Zama? No, just to congratulate him. I am not able to follow it live. It's not, it's not easy. Okay. And so I, I, I'm an old man, and I would have loved to really listen to what he was saying, but uh, I couldn't get him. Maybe I followed the, the right Don't question. Don't worry. If you go to YouTube now, just search Chat Night Africa. Check your uh, WhatsApp box. I've sent it to you. Just click on the link. You will be watching on YouTube right now. Um, if you are not anybody not on Facebook, you have friends and families not on Facebook, they can go on our website, www.chatnightafrica.net or LinkedIn, or uh, I can go on and on YouTube, search Chat Night Africa. Um, Professor Zama, there are so many cooking oils in the market, vegetable oils. And I, I mean, the name... Uh, the name sounds so good. Dr. Zama has fallen off. He will be right back. And I'm going to be asking him a question related to the various cooking oils we have, um, we have uh, uh, on the market. Um, uh, please hold your call because uh, Dr. Zama will be coming back momentarily. You are watching Voices of Africa. Hello. This is... Uh, uh, hello. Hello. I have so many people on the line now. Hello? Hello? Yes, just yeah. please um, shut down whatever. Yes, if you want to dial in, uh, Dr. Zama has to go back to the link to uh, connect to us. If you want to um, dial uh, the number, please turn off your listening device. Simply turn off your listening device. Uh, Dr. Zama will be connecting with us momentarily. Turn off your listening device. If you're watching, turn it off. I have so many questions coming on. Please hold your question. 
he will be uh, on. Um, Kemfo Martin Na says, great, great, great discussions, Professor. Thank you. Um, um, Professor Zama, you have to uh, turn on your camera to be able to uh, connect to me. Somehow you are not turning on your camera. You have to do that to connect back to the studio. My name is uh, Divine Chamokong. So many people are watching this show. Um, you have to, uh, uh, you cannot share your screen. Yeah, so, so please, uh, Professor Zama, just go back to the link and uh, start afresh, join the way you did from the start. My name is uh, Divine Chamokong. Make sure that you are, um, your camera is enabled. Uh, this show is being watched. I'm talking and watching once Professor Zama comes on. I will bring him into the studio. Uh, Dr. Dita says, great show today. Thank you so much, sir. Um, it looks like uh, Professor Zama is having some trouble connecting, but don't worry, stay tuned. I will be getting him on back on to the platform. Um, let me play, uh, bring you a musical interlude while we wait for him to connect back. There's so much you want to hear from him not really that yet not really that yet so um let's have this uh, musical interlude while we wait for uh, platform right now very very good we have a lot of people asking having questions for you okay so you can dial the number 2406037367 please take note once you dial turn off the device the watching the listening device you have around you so that the sound does not come back into your microphone um father maurice aqua need divine thank you for always knowing who to call to come on this show Oh my goodness. All right, thank you uh, so much, Father. I'm reading the comments. Excellent show, that's uh, Ebenezer um, Kong. Ebenezer and Kong, excellent show. Thanks, Professor Zama. If you, okay, the call is on now. Hello. Hey, I'm reading the comments. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes. Please. yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, this is Rosemary. Hello, Rosemary. Hello, Rosemary. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Dr. Yes, Zama, do you hear me? Uh, Rosemary, please turn off any of the, any device you're watching. I just did. I just did. I just turned off everything. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, okay. ask your question. Just go on. No, uh, I just want to thank you for the show. It's really, really very informative, especially the salt, the aspirin, because I... I'm a very healthy individual, but I tend to uh, take the aspirin because I thought it was a very good thing to do. So at least now I know better. So thanks for the free consultation. And the other question that I wanted to ask, is this something that you can do? Because I think this heart attack thing is a very, very common thing now in our community. Uh, is it possible Dr. Zama can really commit to doing this probably once every month so that we can uh, at least get more people to come uh, because we live in a community where people don't really do physical. So this is a very, very wonderful opportunity. And I'm sure that after this, many people will take charge of their health and probably uh, go see their doctors and request for some of these tests or, you know, check up that he has recommended. So I think uh, it will be a great idea if you can be coming more often so that we can really, really take charge of our health. But I just really wanted to uh, appreciate uh, what you've done this evening. It's a very, very wonderful and informative show. All right. Did you hear that, Dr. Zama? Yes, I did. I'd like to thank her, Rosemary, for the kind words. And uh, I would be uh, extremely willing uh, to participate in the forum at any time that you deem necessary uh, to be able to share uh, some of my clinical experience with uh, our people out there, because I think investing in our health is the most important thing we can do uh, to ourselves and our community at large. Dr. Zama. 
You are watching Healthline on Chat Night Africa. My name is Divine Chamakon. I was asking you a question, Dr. Zama, about um, the oils, vegetable oils. It sounds good in the ears. You think that you're getting this vegetable oil, vegetable oils, this olive oil. What is the safest cooking oil? I, and I'm, I'm not asking you to do advertising with anybody, but what is the safest cooking And we, especially from Cameroon, West Africa, Indonesia, we eat a lot of palm oil. Yes. Which is safe? So first up, palm oil is not bad for you. It's like everything, it's, it's, uh, it's the amount of oil you consume. So portion control is extremely important. Now, if you want to drown everything you cook in oil, and you've got more oil than beans in your pot of beans, that's a problem. And, but that's something you see oftentimes. Um, Really, when it comes to oil, I would say this, the science has uh, shown us that oils from plant sources in general that have uh, more saturated uh, components, the saturated, the, uh, I'm sorry, the unsaturated components uh, are healthier for us. So unsaturated oils. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about the olive oils and even some of the palm oil, um, uh, that's good for you. And fats that are high in you know, saturated compounds or saturated fats, as the layperson uh, talks about, uh, may not bode well for your cardiovascular health. Now, so what oils are good for you? I tell you what, I eat peanut, I use peanut oil to cook. You know, uh, we eat peanut oil, and uh, we eat olive oil, but I wouldn't go spending a whole lot of money uh, buying some really fancy, expensive oils um, if you're just you know, looking for something healthy to consume. A small amount of uh, olive oil, vegetable oil of your choice uh, in, the, in your food will, will do you a lot of good and or will not be hurtful uh, to your cardiovascular health. Now, if you tend to fry a lot of foods, and uh, so when you fry foods, you use a tremendous amount of oil, and so much of that gets absorbed in the stuff that you're frying. And then, and if you eat that frequently, fried foods, it can put you at risk for cardiovascular pro well, problem down the line. Now, if you're also looking at, when we talk about health, it's not just cardiovascular health as far as what the oil can do directly to your heart or your blood vessels. It's also things like your weight. If, you know, if you consume an excessive amount of oil, you may find yourself gaining more weight because, and if you're not expending a lot of calories, you know, if your intake with the oil, uh, it's much greater than your output in what you do activity-wise, then it's not a good thing, it's not wise. And if you look at the oils, and I encourage all of you out there to read labels, trust no one. First of all, I don't trust any merchant who is telling me something that is going to go inside me. I got to verify. So I read labels and make it a habit of reading labels. And you will find something interesting when it comes to oil. A tablespoon full of oil contains about 150 calories. And it doesn't matter if it's palm oil or it's olive oil or some expensive variety. Now think about the implications of that. So you think the Mediterranean diet, which has been pushed in America, and you may say, geez, Dr. Zama is saying Mediterranean diet may not be good. I'm not saying it's not good for you, but it's not the panacea. You know, I still have a, people, a lot of people with severe morbid obesity who subsist on Mediterranean diets. And they say, I only eat olive oil. But if your pastor is, 90% oil and 10% pasta, there's a problem. So the quantities of oil you use uh, is, is, is extremely important. And, and like I say, a tablespoonful of oil, whatever oil you choose, has how many calories? About 150 calories. So, uh, so it's the amount of oil that you use that really matters. Keep watching Chat Night Africa! Now you are glued, since you are glued to your TV or computer or phone, watching Chat Night Africa. I have this question I'd like to share with, uh, um, what may have happened to this woman 
uh, a mother so loved, what a what wonderful woman who in the evening sat with her, her children, grandchildren conversing. Then she said, like they say in Africa, make when I go, I go sleep me. In other words, go to your bedrooms, let me go and have, uh, and, and go, let me go to sleep. And this woman went, went to bed, covered herself in, with a blanket and just never moved position in the morning, she was gone. Yeah. What, it, what kind of heart condition? Well, she didn't struggle. Nobody broke in and killed her. She just laid in bed and that was it. How do you, what do you call that typically? Is that heart attack, heart failure? What, what is that? Yeah. There are many conditions that affect the cardiovascular system. One, she could have had a heart attack from a blockage in the coronary artery that she was never aware of, obviously. Two, she could have had, had a, a problem with one of her heart valves. The heart has about four valves, the aortic valve, the mitral valve, the pulmonary valve, the tricuspid valve. And, but more often than not, one of those valves could have been so severe, and it's very common in Africa. Why is that? Because of something called strep, you know? You, strep tonsillitis. Remember when we were kids, there were a lot of children who would have strep throat, and we don't have access to healthcare, let alone antibiotics. And what happens when you have something like a strep infection that is not addressed is that it goes on to cause something called rheumatic fever. And some of the toxins from that bacteria get into your bloodstream, go to your heart, and begin to destroy one or more of your heart valves. And it will take years, maybe 20 years, 10, 20 years, 30 years for the valve to get so destroyed that it, it suffered from irreversible damage. And if nothing is done, your life expectancy would be foreshortened. So she could have died from a catastrophe involving a heart valve. And another thing, she could have gone into a very bad heart rhythm. Maybe she had an abnormal rhythm for years, but she was fully functional, had never seen a doctor or had never been privy to the level of health care that would allow a doctor to make a diagnosis of an electrical problem in her heart. And it just, unfortunately, there comes a time and the time came for her where that electrical system went crazy. It degenerated into even a worse rhythm, a rhythm, for example, we call ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, big fancy words, which means uh, rhythms that something has to be done now. Otherwise, you cannot continue to function or live with this bad rhythm and she may have succumbed to it. Or, as I mentioned before, it's not just the heart, it's the blood vessels that are attached to the heart. She could have ruptured, and this happens a lot in Africa uh, and in America as well, and I would imagine in the UK and the Western world, ruptured her aorta acutely, suddenly. And when you do that, you drown in your own blood and you die. I have done a lot of operations for, 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 for that condition. And I often say these are the luckiest people in the world to have suffered that. And then uh, we're able to, there was a gentleman, a reporter from New York who died during the World Cup. You know, that's what he succumbed to. It was an aortic catastrophe. So, and he died suddenly, got immediate intervention, CPR in, uh, in the Middle East, and, uh, but he didn't make it. So, and this was a robust looking healthy gentleman. So right. there's a whole myriad of problems that you can uh, have that would lead to sudden death. This is what um, gets up Rosemary says. I just started my medical school program <laughs> today. <laughs> Rosemary, you're something else. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, doctor, I'm going to bring you back momentarily to um, to uh, give your last words. I mean, you are colossus, I had described as colossus of uh, heart, issue, heart, uh, heart education. Um, you, you incredible guy. Um, but before I bring you back, uh, I'll be bringing back to say, who, who is Dr. <laughs> Professor Adegli Zama? You come, hold on, hold on that first. Um, and you'll tell us a little bit about yourself. I wanted to keep that for last because people are watching this. I'm like, wow, I sent you a, your bio to somebody. 
that apart from being um, a grad from Harvard Medical School, you hold a PhD in chemistry and this and that and that. I kept going and the guy said, divide. I'm almost having a headache now, stop right there. So that would be my last question in addition to asking you what your last uh, uh, word would be. And um, just uh, hold on for this uh, interlude of uh, music. And uh, this is to give uh, Dr. Uh, Abegizama some time to drink a glass of water. And uh, that's a bit of highlight there for Dr. <laughs> Zama. I don't know how much of high life he knows, but I thought I should uh, give him that interlude of music. And by the way, all of you uh, watching out there, Dr. Zama, in Africa, before I ask you that, that, that question, tell us about yourself. Uh, in Africa, people don't do CPR. What should people do? If you, if you saw somebody just drop like that, just drop off their feet, Forget about 911. We African countries don't know 911. <laughs> if you're not lucky to have somebody drive you to the hospital, um, I don't know. Good luck. Now, so what should what should people around somebody who drops like that from their seat or their feet? What should they do? Or at school, in primary school, in secondary school, in university? Yeah. So um, I'm going to answer that, but I just have to. Uh, several years ago, I happened to be in New York City. I was in a restaurant and. Uh, and I was sitting there, and as I looked across the aisle, I was watching. And, you know, in medicine, you're trained to be very observant. And I was watching this group of people, about six of them, sitting at a table. And uh, the one lady started to look kind of, she was of the Caucasian hue, and she started to look a little blue in the face. And, uh, and she was, her head, head was bobbing back and forth. And, uh, and the guy sitting across from her started to laugh and, and thinking she, this was some type of a humorous uh, thing she was doing. And I immediately jumped out of my seat and I went over to her. And by the time I got there, she'd collapsed like a, you know, a, a, a sack of yams. I use an analogy many of us can relate to. And I grabbed this woman and I did a Heimlich maneuver on her and a chunk of meat was propelled out of her uh, uh, throat uh, onto the table uh, that looked disgusting to some of the folks sitting there, but uh, her color immediately turned pink and she did fine. Long story short, this was a tourist from South America and uh, from Argentina in New York City. And uh, moments later, the uh, mayor of New York came dashing into the restaurant as well and there was a big commotion and I left. And so this is a woman who had suffered, at that point she turned blue uh, she was in, suffered a cardiac arrest uh, from choking. Now, um, when we talk about uh, cardiac arrest, too, as far as the, the heart is concerned, uh, the causes of it, uh, as I've discussed before, you know, you need to, you know, what, if you see somebody who has just collapsed, be sure you know what the circumstances, if, you know, if you don't know what the circumstances are, preceding that event, what you should do is try to wake them up. You know, you can grab them, slap them in the face and say, you know, are you okay? If they do not respond. And, and you know, many of us are brown or darker skin and you may not see that change in color that comes from a low oxygen when your heart stops. And you can feel the pulse and that may be challenging for most of us who do not know where to feel for a pulse in the body. I would say, just go between the nipples and, and start to give them CPR and compress the chest. But right before you do that, if you have company, instruct them to call 911. Now, if you're in Africa and there's no access to 911, I would just start to do CPR and uh, do compressions. And if you compress them uh, fast, and I always say, just go one and two and three 
one and two and three, one and two and three. Now that's simpler. I've instructed people in developing countries, not the classical stuff you hear when you learn to do CPR here, but chest compressions like that. And, and if the person wakes up, you know, usually if they wake up, uh, they'll tell you to stop. And I've seen that happen, but you can save a life. And, uh, and if there's access to a hospital, and that's a real challenge, and, and it hurts me to say this because in America, that would not be a problem. But I've been in South America in the hills where there's no hospital in sight. And, but if there's a hospital or healthcare facility where you can take them expeditiously, uh, it's important to do that. So if you're in America, if you're in Washington, D.C., and you're in an event or you're at home and your loved one collapses, first thing you do, you see if they're, you can rouse them. If they're not arousable, I would say you immediately instruct somebody to call 911 and you, com you, 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 you begin to do chest compressions between the nip nipples. And remember, the heart extends from the center to the left, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, most people say your heart and they put the hand over the right chest. No, that's not where the heart is. That's why you go in the center here and you... And then you kind of clasp the other hand and you keep your shoulders straight and you put all the, your, the pressure of your body onto it as you do the compressions on the chest. And you try to do the compressions to move the chest at least an inch or two. And so you can do it really hard. And sometimes you fracture ribs, but I don't mind fractured ribs with a safe life. Now the question, and this is going to be one of the two last questions, who, is uh, how did you get to where you are? Uh, pe young people who need inspiration, who are hopeless across Africa, people have children, parents have children, they would like to them be like you, and they're asking, how did this guy get here? Uh, tell us, little, I mean, I know you can't tell us the whole story, but summarize it, sir. Well, I'm who not is really special. Professor Zama? I'm not really special and I don't, don't consider myself special uh, and I always look at myself as that little kid from an African village from Cameroon who had very loving parents who believed in me. Now just like many of you out there my narrative is not different than yours and uh, but I had a very rough uh, uh, challenging childhood uh, but filled and suffused with a lot of love. I grew up in a little grass hut with my grandmother. And my mother was always very supportive of my education and so was my dad. So having parents who were attentive, they were literate, they couldn't read or write, but they knew that whatever this kid is embarking on is something great. And they, so I got encouragement, not just from them, from the village, from the family, from relatives, from everybody. And, uh, and eventually actually, and, and, when I look at myself now from a different perspective, as though uh, I'm uh, having an out of body, out of mind, out of experience, experience uh, the one thing that characterized me, I believe, is persistence. I've always used the word importunity and not letting any constraints uh, uh, stop me. And so when I decided I wanted to do something, I stayed on it. Now, I, got, I graduated from secondary school, Sacred Heart. I only spent four years there because I flunked the common entrance and couldn't matriculate in the first year. And so I asked uh, if, I could mat if I could join the first year class and there was no room. They said, but there's room in the second year. So a lot of my colleagues out there would remember that I started secondary school in the second year. And you can imagine, I flunked every test, but that didn't deter me. I just kept working and hustling. And uh, uh, I, the irony of it all is, what. The, the night, greatest nightmare I had was something called chemistry. I'd never heard of the word chemistry, let alone physics, but now I have a PhD in chemistry. So persistence, you know, staying with it and let, don't allow the noise interfere with your trajectory. Everything else is noise. And even uh, financial challenges, I had financial insecurities. I still continue to hustle. I had a farm, I sold pineapples, you know, I would bring back after a few weeks a couple hundred of francs and I'll get reinstated because I got dismissed for non-payment of tuition. But out of that, I, I, the more I learned, the greater my curiosity was. 
And I decided when I discovered that the opportunities were uh, several thousand miles away in America, I said, America is going to be my destination. If you read the book that I wrote, and the new edition is coming out in, a, in about a, a few weeks here, I decided I was going to go to America. A little kid in the village, like many of you out there, without the financial means, they thought I was hallucinating, but I was persistent. And I arrived in New York with 10,000 francs in my pocket, which amounts to about $20 today. And I was homeless, as many of you know, lived in the YMCA, got rescued, uh, you know. Uh, but I went on to, to work two, three jobs. I knew I wanted to be a doctor. My mother had died when I was a little boy, bled to death. She was barely 30 years old after childbirth. And I wanted to make sure that no other kid would have to experience what I've experienced and no parent would have to suffer like she had. And so with that in me, that determination, and that word I keep saying, importunity and determination uh, against all odds. And you, you know, in America in those days, there were many challenges. There were social challenges. A lot of people didn't want to see a little African boy of my hue uh, at the institutions that I attended. Uh, and they made fun of me. There were nasty words. That was called names and stuff. The professors didn't give me the grades I deserved oftentimes. But none of that stopped me. Importunity. If you have your goals set, you know, uh, uh, on, on something of mighty precious value in your life, you need to keep your focus on it. And uh, I've always said, if you're driving 100 miles an hour, don't keep your vision on the rear view mirror because you'll crash. I kept my vision on the road that I was on. And yes, I was able to go on and earn a medical degree, a PhD in chemistry, because I wanted to be a researcher at that time. I didn't know I was going to be a heart surgeon. And, uh, and then along the way, I've always talked about these angels that were stationed. Wherever you are in this world, somebody helped you to get there. And, uh, uh, and they were black folks, white folks, uh, people of all ethnicities. Uh, you notice I don't say race because we're all human race. And that's a, that term is a creation of, uh, of, of uh, people with uh, malicious intent, I always thought. But there were people of various tribes from India, from America, England, uh, you know, poor and rich who saw something in me and gave me the encouragement that I needed and even a sandwich here and there. And yes, I was able to finish medical school. And you know, another thing, I didn't wanna be a doctor. I wanted to be an excellent doctor, not competing with anybody, but I wanted to bring the ultimate value in the ultimate beneficiaries, which were the people that I would be serving in my future. And so I attended the best uh, uh, institutions, got the best training. I didn't shy away from a challenge. There was a time when I said I would be applying to the Cleveland Clinic and people said, that's crazy. You can't get in there. I did. They said, I, said, I want to go to Harvard. They said, oh, you're really crazy now. I did. I was selected the only one in the country or one or two in the country that year uh, to matriculate the train at Harvard Medical School and ultimately went on to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. So uh, it's whatever we do in our lives, always be mindful of that goal and the purpose in life. If What's your purpose should be the question we all ask ourselves. I asked myself that question. And in the final analysis, I realized my purpose was to serve humanity at the highest level of excellence. So whatever I did, whatever I studied, I prepared myself so I could function, can execute, can uh, actualize that purpose at the highest level of excellence. So it's really, I'm a servant and it gives me tremendous pleasure and it's really an honor to be invited at many times. I never turned down an invitation to be able to fellowship with folks like yourself and many of you out there in cyberspace. Great job! Great job! I have a last text here. Somebody is saying, um, Divine, please, can you ask Professor Mche Abegli Zama why, in spite of this top-notch medical education uh, from one of the best schools, if not the best in the world, so accomplished, you remain so humble. What, what is it that makes you so humble? <laughs> That's the question uh, uh, somebody's just sending, uh, sending this to, uh, sent to me. I think we have a little bit of electrical 
uh, challenge here. Uh, okay. Can that, you hear that me? Is, yes, I can. I can hear you. Um, do you hear me also? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, my pa I, my I just, parents just, raised. Do you, do you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. All right. So, this is what uh, somebody said. Gosh. I am not stopping. I am moving on. I'm even more motivated today. That's Gael in London. Rosemary say, says, uh, guess up Rosemary Loom says, um, we need part two of this program. All right. Dr. Ivo Dita says, impressive. Father Morris Aqua, God bless you, Professor. Uh, Ebenezer Nkong, great job, um, Professor Zama. Very inspiring. So, Professor Zama, the text in front of me, you attended the best medical school in the world uh, from very lowly beginnings, um, very accomplished medical doctor, a heart surgeon. You've done thousands and thousands of heart surgeries across the world, some for free. What makes you so humble? That's the question I have in front of you, of, of, of me, sir. Well, I really don't think of myself as being humble. I think of myself as being a servant. And... Uh, I guess the answer that I would give to that is um, um, the Bible tells us this. Jesus said it, you know. Uh, humility is something that it's a quality that I grew up with in my family, for example. Um, I grew up appreciating gratitude, you know. Um, recognizing that I am a piece of a, a, a huge fabric and I bring value to that fabric. And, uh, uh, and so if I look at myself as a servant with a purpose, uh, there's no other way to be but to be humble because I think that's a great responsibility. And I appreciate the fact that God gave me uh, the utensils and the tools that I have to be able to actualize that job as a servant. So it's not something I actually pause and think about, but if I look back now at the way that I was raised, pretty much put me on that trajectory that's led me to where I am today. And so oftentimes people say, well, you know, you're so, I've had patients show up in the hospital and they look beyond me uh, to meet the Dr. Zama, uh, the cardiac surgeon, and it's, you know, maybe somebody with four or five horns on their head. And just to realize that the guy that passed down the hall who said hello to him and asked how things were going was uh, Dr. Zama. It's just, uh, uh, it's, as the French say, it's my raison d'etre, it's my, uh, you know, just my constitution and it's the way that I was raised. And, and I, I, I never feel like I know it all. I have high level of personal insecurity because I always feel I need I'm not working hard enough. I'm not helping as much as I should. And so uh, those are the weaknesses. That's a weakness that I have that I live with. Now, somebody may extrapolate that into the term that you've used that it's part of the humility complex. If that be, well, you know, then that's what it is. But I'm just a servant. And a servant can be anything but humble. All right. <laughs> People, somebody's putting on the spot right now. Divine Alex Ngati says, I can never ever have enough of this guy. Can you give him a permanent spot on Chat Night Africa on Healthline? Um, I, I I don't think he will say no. He's a very, very busy guy. I can tell he's all over the world. He's all over the place. I mean, he's on the plane almost every week. But we will try all we can to bring him here as often as we can. Do you have a last word, sir? What should people remember having listened to you speak to them about their health, about the possibility of going to bed this night and not getting up in the morning tomorrow? Well, only God above will determine how many of us uh, spiritually still around the planet uh, tomorrow. But the one thing that I know is uh, that I am a product of my genes and the environment. The science has told us what can happen to me if I don't take good care of my heart. And what can happen to me, I'm talking about the risk factors. So for people out there, uh, know the risk factors of the, for the most common cause of death in America, 
that takes away close to 4,000 people each day in this country and millions more across the world. And what are those risk factors? High blood pressure. Know your blood pressure and know what the normal uh, recommended uh, levels are for your blood pressure. Time doesn't permit us to go into it, but that's something you can, you can find out out there, recommendations from the American Heart Association. Take care of your blood pressure. Take your medicine if you have high blood pressure. Reduce the risks of high blood pressure. Reduce the amount of salt that you eat and eat everything in moderation. Don't eat too much oil. And uh, what are the other risk factor? Diabetes. If you have it, please take care of it. Eat the right things. Don't start splurging. You know, type 2 diabetes is extremely common now because if you do, your chances of uh, having cardiovascular disease will be uh, much greater. If you smoke, stop smoking. There's no gradual stoppage. No, it has to be an acute because when you stop smoking, you reduce your chances of dying from the most common cause of death on the planet, cardiovascular disease. Not only that, you reduce your chances of dying from the most common cause of cancer death in America. You know what that is. It's something that I deal with too as a cardiothoracic surgeon. It's lung cancer. So when you stop smoking, it helps your heart. And uh, another thing, if you have high cholesterol, see a doctor. You may be able to take a pill for it if this is genetic. But I usually recommend natural approaches first. You know, reduce your weight, reduce the amount of food in, in your diet. Now, if you're overweight, lose weight. Remember, God gave you a certain size heart and matched it with a certain size body. If you put a Volkswagen engine in an 18-wheeler, what's going to happen in a Mack truck? It's not going to go far. And if it does, that engine will burn up in a short period of time. So if you have a heart, your heart is not going to get bigger and stronger if you gain weight. They gave you a heart to fit a certain weight. And if you gain a significant amount of weight, you begin to put stress on your heart. And you can see the relationship there. Very simplistic between weight gain and cardiovascular disease. But if you gain weight, your sugar goes crazy, your blood pressure goes crazy, your lipids, your fat goes crazy in your bloodstream, and your risk is through the roof for cardiovascular disease. And so all these things, if you can do them and they're not bad, reduce stress in your life. Don't try to be like the Joneses next door. Manage your stress. Accept your limitations. And, and That's a big one. And stay more physically active. Walk at least 30 minutes a day. Take care of the most important thing you possess. It's not your children, your car, your house. It's your body. Because if you're not here, you're worthless to all of us. And we all need each other. I love you. Nche says, Nche Afe says, <laughs> In Bali, we say Fanji Kanjamu. <laughs> that has been, oh my goodness, I could sit here all day <laughs> watching uh, this brilliant, brilliant Harvard trained cardiothoracic surgeon. Thank you so much, Professor Nche Abegli Zama. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and that's how we end this week's edition. I know people would love to go. Rosemary says this is the best show, absolutely the best show on Chat Night Africa. We do our best. I want to also thank everybody who has been contributing for this show, this platform to look this beautiful, for us to do the lots of things, the equipment, the software, hardware. Some are watching. They just don't want us to... I call their names publicly. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Richard Munang. Uh, it's very late now in Kenya, Nairobi, where you are, but you stayed up to watch this eminent uh, professor, Nche Abegli Zama. Thank you for coming to Healthline on Chat Night Africa, sir. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, now, before he goes away, before he goes away, he's in the green room, I am um, suggesting to Dr. Zama, to go back into comments when he has time to respond. There are just so many questions. I couldn't bring all the questions on the platform uh, to go back there when he has time to respond to um, your, your, your inquiries. 
Um, gosh, thank you so much, Professor Beatrice for Munin. Everybody's just throwing flowers and flowers and flowers on you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you, sir. This show is on our website, it's on the internet. It's been broadcasting, airing on the internet. Uh, www.chatnetafrica.net. It's also now, it's, it's been airing on YouTube. Um, you can go there and share and share. Please show us love, like the page. Finally, finally, the thing I want to say, if you're organizing any occasion, whether on Mount Everest, Chat Night Africa with the help of friends, with the help of friends, acquire some equipment. We can come and broadcast your event wherever you are to different platforms across the globe. My name is Divine Chamakon, and that's how we say Mexi à tout le monde. I will be wrapping up now, and we will see. I will uh, do all I can to bring back Dr. Zama, <laughs> back to Dr. Zama here. Have a wonderful week, everyone, and that has been Voices Chat Night Africa. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to keep down. I'm coming. I'm coming, coming to dance, to dance. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance. We're gonna get down, we're gonna get down. We're gonna party, party hard. We're gonna book it, book it, work it. And when we jam, it's out of sight. This song right here, it's dynamite. 